Please remember to like, subscribe and comment as we love to hear back from our viewers. Also, if you enjoy our videos, please consider becoming a patron of our show through Patreon and or GoFundMe. Links are listed below the video in the description. From the deepest, darkest recesses of Dangerous Nerds headquarters, Keith Moncrief and Gary Cassell. Yeah. Blade Runner. He say, you, you say Blade Runner. <laughs> it's 2019, kids. That's right. It's the year of Blade Runner. And that's Keith. That's Gary. And this is Pop Culture Minefield. And today Ooh. is our Blade Runner day. Oh. And by the way, right back there, that's my uh, spinner kits. I have two of them, and uh, I love Blade and I have the action figures from Blade Runner 2049. Too. Oh, no, don't forget the book, Future No. Oh, and I'm in the book. Yeah, I'm mentioning the book. Yay! Um, so basically, we're going to talk about Blade Runner, and Blade Runner is the single most influential film in my life, and uh, the second one is The Thing. It's basically the top five movies of all time that I love will never change. Are Ridley Scott and John Carpenter? <laughs> Those two—they had an impact on me, man. They really had an impact on me. Two guys that don't take no off of nobody. <laughs> nope. Harkening back to our last episode, those are two guys you don't want to mess with. Yeah, John Carpenter. Uh, now, he, politically, very liberal guy, very liberal, but he writes so damn well that you don't care. And that's what's missing today. John Carpenter knew how to write a politically driven film, but make it so entertaining that people of two different political belief systems enjoyed it. I know a lot of conservatives that love Escape from New York. And Escape from New York was a direct criticism of Ronald Reagan and the, the, the push towards a national police force. And, of course, Bill Clinton pushed for that, and then eventually Obama pushed for a national police force. We have the FBI. They're horrible. <laughs> but they're necessary. And, uh, and, and, uh, but John Carpenter knew what he was doing, man. That guy knows how to tell a damn story. Mm -hmm. He knows how to create characters. And my favorite thing, again, bringing up something I brought up in a previous episode, is stoicism. He writes really stoic characters. And, uh, and he himself is a very stoic dude. I don't know if you've ever listened to him talk. Now, he's a funny dude. Don't get me wrong. He's very outgoing. He's, he can be charming, sort of, in his weird way. But the fact is, though, when it comes down to it, he's very stoic. Mm -hmm. He's very reserved with his emotions. And, uh, and that comes out in his characters. And he writes really good stoic characters, interesting characters, with the past, with the history and, and stuff. I Snake love Plissken. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know what? There's a reason why he got nominated for Starman. You know, very. I mean, there are still people that don't even know that's a John Carpenter film. Nope. Well, they don't even know uh, Christine's John Carpenter thing because they all think The Thing, Escape from New York, Big Trouble, Little China, which are on my top five list. Those three films. Mm -hmm. uh, Carpenter was that was what he did, and then of course uh, They Live, which was a fantastic film. The Fog. The Fog great horror from Halloween that started it all, you know. He understood the concept of how to write a villain. And this is, this is something that you and I have talked about in the past, too, where, uh, you know, plot, there's a difference between plot and story. Plot is a device that's used within a story, but not every story has a plot or needs a plot, okay? But you can't make a plot a story, which is what they did with Brightburn. Have you seen it yet? I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, you need to see it. I've got a huge big chip on my shoulder about that movie and how everybody loves it. And I'm like, you love a plot. That's all you do. It's a premise. It's not a story. Um, even Carpenter understood that Michael Myers needed Dr. Loomis as his foil. She wasn't his foil. Dr. Loomis was. He was a, a necessity to help bring about a challenge to Michael Myers. 
And of course, with Brightburn, you don't have anything to challenge this character. It's Superman with nobody. It's just basically everybody's t tissue paper to him. It just wipe right through him. It's like, so I'm sitting there and I'm watching it. And I'm like going, this is a stupid movie. <laughs> it's like, how am I supposed to? And of course they go, this is a superhero for evil. And I'm like, no, that's called a super villain, you dumbass. It's a super, it's a super villain origin story. And of course it supposedly ends, because I didn't stay through the credits. I was so disappointed. It ends with a Wonder Woman type character and another character that are supposed to be super too. And that's supposed to be the lead up for the next film. And I'm like, I'm not in. I'm not in. You needed to hook me with the first film. And it's just not very good. Not even sharks with freaking lasers? <laughs> no. <laughs> I wish I could do that voice, <laughs> Dr. Evil. Give me a freaking break here. But what we're here to talk about today is Blade Runner. Yes. And so we're going to come yes. back around to this because Ridley Scott is probably one of the greatest directors of the latter 20th century. And I don't consider him a great director anymore, as much as I love him. Um, he's kind of fallen off his own pedestal, and and he's broken some of his own rules in storytelling, which really annoyed me because he established with Alien that you that even when you do everything right, you still might die. That was the scary thing about Alien is that they tried to do everything to stop this thing, and they still got wiped out, right? Well, then he turns around and makes Prometheus and breaks every one of those rules. Every single person died in that film but one. Idris Elba died of doing something stupid. So, but Blade Runner is a film that has almost no story. But it's a classic. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you see it? Oh, man. You know what? I saw that movie for the first time in Kansas City at a convention. My very first convention I ever attended. Downtown Kansas City in 1983. Wow. And it, it made me not only love movies, which I, I I did like watching film, but I loved movies after seeing that film. And I wanted it to, to be in filmmaking because of it. So Yeah, it's it, it had a huge impact. I mean it changed the way I looked at storytelling. Yeah. And uh up it was to that real. It was yeah, real. it was very dark. That that movie was real. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Now, when I went to see it, I went to see it with Jim, uh, my friends, and uh, Jim is one of the producers on the show. Jim Woodward, Bennett Sumner, uh, m I think Mike Vida was there, and these are still friends of mine. And uh, and I I'm positive David Gray was there. We lost David Gray from diabetes back in the early two thousands, and um, we all went to see this movie. And we were expecting. Han Solo, Indiana Jones. And instead we get this dark dystopic film <laughs> where all this guy kills his women. <laughs> and I, I remember we were, we were so quiet walking out and walked out. And, and, and Craig Edwards, another producer on the show, uh, was in the line to see it next. And I walked out and I, I didn't even know what to say to him. You know, I just kind of walked out. Hey, Craig. Hey, you see better? And we went on out, got in the car, we didn't talk. We sat in that car, drove all the way back home. Everybody got dropped off. I got dropped off. Never spoke about it. Finished the last week of school, actually the last two or three days. Got a copy of the book, Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Read it. And then by before the weekend came, we all agreed that we wanted to go see it again. So we went back to the Greenbrier Theater there in Fredericksburg, Virginia, to see it again. And we had a completely different reaction to it. I was so in love with that movie. It, it just, I finally understood what he was trying to make here. <clears throat> and it changed the landscape of cinema. Mm -hmm. It is the single most influential science fiction in the history of cinema. Single. Uh, that's according to American Film Institute and the British Film Institute. They both list as uh, the, the number one science fiction film. And it's in the top list of the top 100 films of all time. And it is listed by both as the single most influential film. Not just sci-fi film, but film. It has visually influenced more filmmakers mm -hmm. than any other film. And you can see it all the time. Uh, films that have the Blade Runner look. Mm -hmm. It all came from Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott, some crazy Welsh director, went out there and made a film like that. And he would do the same stuff, like in Legend. He did the same thing. But uh, let's talk about some trivia. Well, what do you what do you think we should bring up? Should we do some questions? I think we should do a question or two. 
See, All right. See what you know. And again, if any of this is new to you, if you've never seen Blade Runner, take take our suggestion and just check it out. Now, is this film for everyone? No, and that's what's great about it. Not every film is for everybody. But I will say this. Even if it's not for you, you're going to come out the other end of this film and you will at least have to admit it's like nothing you've ever seen before. It's a complete world unto itself. It's incredible world building within this story. And you get so much of that lived in, real, true, just feeling of, of, of with all the characters and the atmosphere and just every time it rains, I still think I can look up and see a spinner coming out of the sky. You know, it is just, it, it, it just affected me personally. And I, I love it. I just love the film. It's, it's, and what's amazing is um, you can watch that film from 1982 today. And because of the effects in it, it stands up today, yeah. which is part of the trivia question, which is uh, uh, which visual effects supervisor made that Oscar-winning special effects for that film? Was it uh, uh, John Dijkstra, Richard Edlund, or Douglas Trumbull? I go with Doug Trumbull. It was Doug Trumbull. Douglas Trumbull, uh, who had worked with Richard Edlund uh, on 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yep. And, uh, but Richard Edlund did not work on it, but he did work on Alien. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't know that Trumbull also did a little bit of work on Star Trek The Motion Picture. He was not the visual effects supervisor for that film. Industrial Light and Magic was in charge of that. But... He was in charge of the light effects that were used in there because he nailed how to do light effects. Mm -hmm. uh, he proved it with uh, Close Encounters and then turned around and did it with Star Trek and then with Blade Runner. He created that lens flare that, uh, better than JJ could ever dream of doing, he created lens flare that felt realistic like you were in the environment and he created layers uh, using smoke. And in fact, it was doing that that... Uh, led to an incident on the set where all the sh footage that was shot of the pyramid was all you were ever going to see in the film because it caught fire and burned up and they didn't have the budget to build it again. So all the footage you see in the film was used from whatever they had. They weren't allowed to make any more. Wow. Wow. Now, uh, the book, of course, uh, that it's based on was... and. Uh, we just watched a thing from Minty, and it cracked me up because Minty was incorrect. He said Blade Runner was more inspired by the book by Philip K. Dick, uh, "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" It's not true. Uh, basically, he took the, the the bare bones of the story, so it's there. The bare bones of the story is there, including the reference to World World War Terminus, uh, which is why all the animals were dying. That's good. And, 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 and thus the emphasis on, on, on certain questions during the Von Kampf test about helping an animal. Yeah, because animals were all dying. So animals became part of the Void Kampf test, and the Void Kampf test came from the book. Uh, pretty much a lot of the things that are referenced in there, uh, even though they don't say um, uh, Andes, because that's what they were called in the book, uh, they called them replicants for the film, uh, they do reference the Nexus 6, which is from the book too. Uh, Roy Batty, the characters are from the book, too. The one big difference is um, J.F. Sebastian, uh, played by my friend uh, Bill Sanderson, mm -hmm. he, uh, his character is based off of uh, John Isidore, a chicken head. He's called a chicken head because he's got a low IQ. But you question how dumb he is mm -hmm. uh, because um, maybe he's not so dumb. And, and But the thing is, the government in the book deemed anybody who decides to stay and not leave the earth mm -hmm. to be something wrong with them. So he got diagnosed with being a chicken head. <laughs> but there was something... Here's a good JF one. Um, JF Sebastian suffered from a condition. And do you know what the name of the condition is that made him look older? In the movie. 
because uh, it's there's actually a different name for it in real life. Mm. No, I can't recall. It's called the Methuselah syndrome, and in it, he my glands. It's my glands. I, my glands go old. They grow old. I love the way he talks and that he's so boyish, childlike. And he was supposed to be. He's supposed to be very childlike. But in reality, the condition is called, uh, I think it's called progeria. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but it's, it's interesting. They, they gave it its own name in that, uh, Methuselah syndrome. And wow. uh, let's see. What, what else would be something interesting to do a question on for Blade Runner? You got one? Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay. Um, you have, uh, okay, uh, in what year was the movie set? A lot of you out there should know. Yeah, you better know. Good God. <laughs> All you gotta do is look at your calendar right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, basically, um, it takes place in 2019, and uh, even though in, in the book, I think it was uh, 1997, because there was a joke made by Harry Bryant in there about, uh, you know, uh, about not rushing it to 1990-something, and I just thought that was funny. But um, uh, going back to uh, uh, something was with some music that I found interesting was, Originally, Ridley Scott wanted to use a song by the Ink Spots, uh -huh. and it, it was the uh, sort of love song that plays in the background when he's getting booze, and uh, that in fact, it's in the work print, the original Ink Spot song is, but because he wasn't going to pay them uh, 10000 the royalties, were, they yeah. wanted $10,000 for it or something that they weren't going to pay, so he just turned to Vangelis and says, can you write a song like that, Evangelist's like, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> so he writes this song called One More Kiss, Dear. And it's very similar thematically to the song by the Ink Spots, uh, but it's it's a completely new song, but it sounds like something right out of the 30s. Wow. And so there you have it. Um, let's see, which we talk about. Uh, I, you know, I thought it was interesting uh, there was a resurgence, and a lot of it had to do with my Blade Runner website, Blade Zone. Mm -hmm. Blade Zone kept the, sh the movie alive and brought in a lot of new fans. But the fact is, Warner did something very interesting, uh, and this was back in the, in the late 90s. Uh, they re-released the theatrical cut in 70 millimeter print mm -hmm. and did the Warner Brothers Film Festival, and it, it went to Kansas City. And I went to see it in Kansas City. Really? Yes, the Warner Brothers Film Festival. Got to watch some really good stuff. There were other films being shown during the film festival, but the main focus was that Warner Brothers had it pulled its films out of vault, cleaned them up, and sent them to the theater. And I got to see the actual original theatrical version of the movie in wow. a big print. And it was beautiful. Let me tell you something. Um, uh, we were in that one theater in Kansas City with big the with the biggest screen. And it was beautiful to watch. I'm telling you right now. I miss the days wow. when... Because you don't have it anymore. You don't have film grain when you watch these movies that are shot in HD. Yeah. Uh, film grain was something that actually caught your eye. And like these slow scenes, there was still movement within them. And that's from the grain of the film. That doesn't exist anymore. When you watch HD now, it's this clear, smooth image. And you just don't get it. And Blade Runner, uh, watching those old movies, and I still do, I still love watching old movies, uh, I will sit down and watch Blade Runner at least twice to three times a year. It's a good movie. Yeah, Classic it is. film. Uh, definitely visually just stunning. Was there something you wanted to bring up about Zora that we were talking about earlier with uh, um, some of the technology? Was that it? Was it the Esper? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the technology where they would go into a room. They can investigate yeah, a yeah, room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you were talking about Oh, that we were talking about Harrison Ford. That's what yes, it was. Yes, yes. Some of the problems. Because like, there was problems with the narration. Uh, people were spreading this rumor that what wasn't true, that Harrison Ford completely uh, flubbed his reading for the narration. It wasn't true. It's not true. He did the best he could with really badly written dialogue. 
But uh, the fact is, is uh, a lot of people get this wrong. They think that uh, he was angry and wanted to uh, make it fail. So they wouldn't use that. And it's like, that's not true. That's not what he did. He did the best he could. The, what he was upset about was that Jerry Perinchu and Bud York had taken over the production, over Ridley, fired Ridley, and were doing this narration without him. And on top of that, it was the second to third time that he had to go to record narration because he'd done previous narration with Ridley for yeah. the work print. Yeah. And it just... Uh, it, it, and, and the movie's yeah. how long again? Well, each one's different. <laughs> It, yeah, but I mean, overall, the, the theatrical cut is... Two two hours and uh, nine minutes, I think, something yeah, like that. Yeah, and trying to do voiceover for a two-hour well, plus movie. Ford wanted a, a, a detective film. Yeah. And so he did pitch a fit with Ridley saying, you've got me playing a detective, not doing any detective work. Yeah. So that's why they added some of the detective work where he's going through the photos and he does the Esper scene, which is really cool where you put a photo in... And he investigates a room without being in the room. He can actually go around corners and stuff because the Esper is able to read light. And and that is without creating any kind of a virtual environment. That literally But it taking... really is talking about a virtual yeah. environment, creating one. And it's it was something from 1982. They talked about something that they're starting to do now using light refraction and reflection to determine what's on the other side of a wall. Wow. So it's it's brilliant stuff. Uh, Blade Runner is is just to this day still stands out as one of the greatest films ever made. Uh, any favorite moments? For me, it is, of course, the iconic beginning on his way to uh, uh, when Deckard gets picked up. Oh, by Gaff. Yeah, uh, Edward just, James almost was great as Gaff. Just seeing the city, the the spinners. Really, just everything. I mean, J.F. Sebastian's home, uh, the the building where he lives, uh, it, it really is all predicated. The first time um, uh, Deckard meets uh, Rachel and testing her using the Von Kamp test, and just the entire film is just... Brilliant. And once again, the Voight Kampf was right from the book. Yeah. And in fact, the questions he asks her are from the book. Those are straight from the book. Wow. The tortoise, too. That's all included. You know, all those questions were right out of the book. Philip K. Dick, you know, Minty, I love Minty, but he gets some of his facts like way wrong. and But he does a good job of at least getting people interested yeah. in these things. So, but anyway, with that, uh, I guess we're done. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. Is there anything else? No, that's pretty much it. We talked about Blade Runner. Uh, if you guys have any questions about Blade Runner or any films in general that we're going to be talking about Fridays, we're always going to talk about film. You got any suggestions? Let us know. Press the like button. You know, subscribe. Because you'll like to know when we post something new. And we love it when you guys, Pie, we love it when you post. But some other people, you got to start posting. Come on, guys. And ask questions from or people. make really cool comments, something. Exactly. So, uh, but anyway, that's it. Uh, happy Friday. Uh, this is Keith. And this is Gary. And it's been Pop Culture Mind Built. And, uh, you know what? We're out of here. So get out of here. Get off the lawn. You, you there with the bug eyes. Get off the lawn. Happy Friday. <laughs>